Welcome to our regularly scheduled July 15th, 2019 work session. Tonight we have three items on the agenda. Public comment is allowed that is germane to each agenda item. If you speak, you are required to fill out a public comment card and turn it into the city clerk uh, before the agenda item has been called. If you are speaking on behalf of an organization, you must fill out an affidavit that you have the authority of said organization. Remember, <clears throat> this is not a time to engage the mayor or members of city council in conversation. When your name is called, please come forward and speak into the microphone, stating your name and address for the record. Public comment will be allowed for a total of 10 minutes per agenda item and no more than two minutes per person. <clears throat> public comment will be heard at the beginning of each item. Once the item is called, no other public cards will be accepted. So Sudi, if you will please call their agenda item number one. Our first item, discussion of 2019 capital improvement element, CIE, 2019 annual update, report relating to the city's impact fee program, Mr. Parag Agrawal. And I will ask Sudi, do we, do we have any public comment on that item? We do not, sir. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Parag Agrawal, City's Community Development Director. Uh, the item number one on the agenda is the consideration of the resolution to transmit the annual update of the capital improvement element to the Georgia Department of Community Affairs and the Atlanta Regional Commission, ARC. Today, I also have with me Michelle McIntosh Ross, who is the project manager, and our lead consultant, Ross and, Ar Ross and Architects, uh, Paige Hadley. As we know, the City Council adopted the impact fee ordinance on uh, October 5th, 2015. And the state requires the communities that have an impact fee program should submit an annual update to the Department of Community Affairs for the capital improvement element. <clears throat> so the city's impact fee program has been very successful over the last four years. In the last fiscal year, the city collected around $1.3 million and those $1.3 million were spent on providing capital services to our fire, police, roads, parks, and recreation. Around 60% of our impact fee money goes to the parks and recreation department for their capital improvement projects. Uh, upon, upon the review, upon the state's review, the city of Milton will adopt the 2019 CIE update on October 31st, 2019. So that is our deadline to adopt this element after the state's review. In the next fiscal year, the city is also proposing to conduct a study to analyze our impact fee program to see how we can basically make it much more uh, stronger and much more useful for our different city needs. So today's presentation is only for the informational purposes. Uh, this item will also be in front of you on your July 22nd meeting. And at that time, in the July 22nd meeting, the city council will make a final vote to transmit the resolution to the Department of Community Affairs. So today is only for informational purposes. On July 22nd, you will vote on it so that the resolution can go to the Department of Community Affairs. So with this, I will turn this uh, presentation to our consultant, Paige, who will basically walk you through the 10-page report. Thank you. Thank you, and good evening. Uh, my name is Paige Hatley. I work with Bill Ross with Ross & Associates, who I think you all, or many of you are familiar with. Uh, he would normally be here, but unfortunately is out of town, but he will be joining us for the public hearing that's required prior to the transmittal of the annual update. Uh, the director did a fantastic job giving an overview of what is a routine, uh, straightforward reporting requirement. Uh, that's mandated of all impact fee communities. Um, I would just um, elaborate slightly uh, to say that um, while the name is called the CIE Annual Update, we're not updating or amending the capital improvements element that was uh, adopted by the city in 2015. Of course, the CIE lists uh, the approved capital projects that are eligible for impact fee funding, as well as the cost estimates that are um, associated with implementing those projects. We are merely providing an update to the state as to what transpired in the last fiscal year in terms of collections, expenditures of impact fees, 
and what capital projects are anticipated to be implemented or started or be underway in the next five years. So all of that information is presented in less than 10 pages. Um, for those of you who um, have seen this in the past few years, nothing has changed as far as the format. The state is accustomed to the format that we've provided. Um, it starts off with a brief uh, financial report, specifically a series of financial tables on the first few pages uh, that breaks the um, expenditures and collections down by public facility category. Um, and then it concludes with a, an updated uh, CWP or community work program for the years 2020 to 2024, uh, which just lists uh, the approved projects that are anticipated to be underway in the next five years. Um, very straightforward. I, I can go through page by page in detail if you'd like, or we can just uh, take questions or discussion. Sure. Um, at this point, I'll just open. Is there any questions on the front end on this? Okay. Um, it's up to you guys if you want to go through it, or, or we can digest it and later before we have our public hearing. Okay. Okay. And thanks to staff, um, everyone has been very helpful each year in providing the information that makes it so much easier for us to pull together a concise report. So thank you to Michelle and <laughs> her staff. Thank you. Okay. Stacey, will you please sound our next agenda item? So the next agenda item is discussion regarding the master plan for the former Milton Country Club. Okay, and uh, before we, before Prague stands up, do we have any public comment? And just for those in the audience who just arrived, if you have any public comment, please fill out a yellow card and uh, bring it up to our city clerk if you wanted to speak on this item. We do have several public comments. Yeah, there you go. So another one too. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. Stacy, if you'd please call the first. Okay. The first one is Lauren Holmes and Mandy White. I'm Lauren Holmes, 13900 Haygood Road. Uh, Mandy White. We are uh, co founders of Children's Charities. And we're here just to give you an overview of. The fact that we know you're talking about the country club and it's someplace that when the time comes, we would like to be considered to be put in there. Okay. Um, as you guys know, for the past about two and a half years, we've been trying to raise money for an all inclusive play park. It is something we would like to donate to the city, and I'm really happy to say that we are very, very close to the final funding for this park. Um, as you know, it's something that the state doesn't even have. Um, this is a park that would include um, play pieces for all abilities and disabilities. It'll be kind of a one-of-a-kind um, park that this city will be just incredibly, it's going to be great. Anyway, point of the whole thing is we have now secured approximately, with the discount, about $700,000 on this park through different sponsorships. And tonight we just want to say that thank you for the opportunity to give it to the city. And if it could be included into the Milton City Country Club would be a perfect place that we feel it could go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Stacy, if you'd call the next speaker. The next speaker is Stephanie Manat. I always said your name wrong, I'm sorry. Um, my name is Stephanie Minot. I'm at 775 Quarter Path Lane in Milton. Um, I am one of the uh, parents that is in charge of the swim team at the Milton Country Club. And first of all, I want to say thank you for your support of the swim team. Uh, last year we had 87 participants. This year we're up to 143. Uh, we are looking to increase that number for next year. With that being said, we would love to see some improvements to the facility. Uh, we'd love some improvements to the pool area. We would also love some access to the interior of that building. Uh, anytime that camps are held or um, for the tennis program or if we have inclement weather, we have nowhere for our, our athletes to go. Um, we also use part of that building um, when we host meets to um, 
set up our computer programs and our systems. So we would love some uh, access to the interior of that building. Uh, thank you very much for your support and look forward to working with you all later. Thank you. Next speaker is Charles East. Hey, good evening. I'm Charles East, uh, 390 Coach House Lane. I'm a, a parent of two swimmers on the swim team uh, that participated both in the, in the first year last year and then this year as well. We saw tremendous growth in the swim team program. I think it was up like um, almost 70% over the first year versus the second year. We had some great success also uh, with about 30 of the kids being able to participate in the, uh, the Atlanta Metro Championships down at Georgia Tech. Um, it's, it, the program itself has been a great program for my daughters uh, and myself and my wife as well, getting to know some of the other families in the city and, and be able to, to have the kids interact with some of the kids that they, they may not be able to meet on a daily basis throughout the city of Milton. And I think also uh, the SWIM program is also an opportunity for the city to really showcase the city of Milton. We have uh, competing programs that come in, but most of these times the other programs are uh, neighborhood pro pools, neighborhood uh, 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 programs that aren't city supported. So I think it's an opportunity for the city to really showcase what the city has to offer. Uh, in terms of, of, of the needs for the program going forward, um, it would be nice to be able to access the, uh, the clubhouse facility for, for running competitions, having a, an area for the kids to go during inclement weather, and just maybe expand some of the, uh, um, the space where the competing teams have uh, access to in the pool deck as well. So if there's any opportunity to expand the use of the clubhouse to the, to the swim program, uh, I'd really like to see you guys consider that. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Scott Minot. Um, Scott Minot, 775 Quarter Path Lane. Uh, Stephanie uh, is my wife. So um, I have a lot of experience with the swim team. Uh, from being on the outside, but also having the kids uh, involved. We started out four years ago, and my kids, I have 11-year-old triplets, and they couldn't even swim a lap. And, you know, when it was Milton Country Club, we came in and, and we joined and we participated, and the coaches taught our kids to swim, and and they've continued to progress to the point where one of my sons uh, – you know, has finished twice at Tech, once ninth place and once 12th place out of 330 kids in his age group. Um, so it's been, you know, real beneficial to us. And we uh, continued to be a part of the pool when um, Milton City, you know, took it over. And we're grateful for that. And we appreciate the support for both the swim team and the pool program during the summer. Um, to echo everybody else's comments, we'd love to see some access um, to the clubhouse. Uh, and then we'd love to see some improvements to the pool, um, umbrellas, uh, furniture, you know, maybe some additional improvements. Um, and, you know, we, we were there last year, um, the first year of the program, as we, you know, as y'all sold well the city sold memberships and we saw the number of people that showed up at the pool um on peak days you know skyrocket we were up there one day and there were 90 you know 95 people there and that was like a rolling 95 that's people going out and people coming in so i think we're getting a lot of support from the community as steph said going from 87 to 143 swimmers um we expect that to grow you know, again next year. Um, and I will say one thing, I, I'm 100% um, supportive uh, of the playground, um, but I, the one place that it could go, I think is right where we stage swim teams. So I don't know if there's a way that that property's configured that, you know, could service both, both needs, but, um, just something to, to think about, and I'm sure we'll have lots of um, conversation. But again, I'm, I think the playground is awesome um, just to figure out where the be best place to put it is. Thanks. Thank you. City, do we have any more public comment? We do. We have Miss Natalie Henderson.
Hi, I'm Natalie Henderson. Uh, my address is 315 Oakhurst Leaf Drive here in Milton. And uh, I am the head coach for the Milton Mustangs swim team. And I have been a part of Summer Swim League since I was five years old. So this was my 15th season doing it. And I think this program is very beneficial to kids in this area because it's also, it's a great activity for kids to stay active during the summertime, but it's also a huge social part of their life that they get to meet friends outside of their school grades. And so I would love to see this program continue for many more years past this. And we are th very thankful that we've had the pool for the past two summers. And so um, just to kind of talk about what they said was um, we would love access to the pool house um, and to, well, to the clubhouse and just to kind of have like an office area or some storage space um, that we can put our stuff and equipment in there. And then to make this be this program better for the kids, um, some new diving blocks would be um, very nice. And then also some new flags and maybe possibly some new lane lines to help like get this program going. Thanks. Thank you. Sweetie, if you please call the next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Paul Harper. <clears throat> Good afternoon, my name is Paul Harper. I live at 15345 Laurel Grove, and we are new to the neighborhood, and uh, well, my wife Desiree is behind me. We've got two children who have joined the swim team, and they have just blossomed beyond belief, move, having moved into the neighborhood. Both have excelled. Um, it's, it's, it has been a phenomenal um, thing to witness. So um, really appreciate the opportunity and for Natalie to um, lead those swim, the swim team and the coaching. It has been phenomenal. In terms of access to the... Um, uh, the, the the kind of the main building. I mean, what I have seen or experienced in the past is kind of a multi-purpose um, facility, what I would call open, mixed open space, with maybe the ability to hold conferences in there, that sort of thing, or if there's swim swim meets, people can set up computers, that sort of thing. Um, you know, but but then also extending that to kind of things like you know, if there are workshops on Saturday and Sunday for the youth or um, things like, uh, you know, bingo for the elderly and things like that, that are just fun for the community, really bring it in as a community center and facility. Um, and so that would be, you know, my, my kind of input um, and, you know, potentially with the ability to have some uh, a place to stage food, so just like on the swim teams, you can maybe potentially make uh, access to the food um, or, or access to the hamburgers, etc. just more easily for the people to, to facilitate that. I do also support um, the playground. It sounds good. I guess location just needs to be discussed. But thank you very much, and thanks for the support. My children absolutely love it, and so thank you. Thank you, and welcome to Melbourne. Thank you. Thank you. So if you please call the next speaker. I have two to read into the record. The first is from Mary Williams at 15270 High Grove Road. She says, one, do not provide food service on property. It brings rodents and predators to the area, making it less safe for pets and children. And second, we need to open areas to walkers. Temporary fencing can help control walkers until a final plan is implemented. And our last comment to read is from Mark Starnes, 1810 Highgrove Club Drive, Milton. This property is contiguous to the parkland. My comments are to echo the sentiments of many of my fellow Milton citizens to compel the city to continue the use and support the Milton Public Pool, its surrounding amenities such as the clubhouse and tennis facility, and make necessary upgrades so as to expand the capacity for eventual year-round use by the citizenry. My family participated in our seventh Milton Mustang swim team and enjoyed yet another successful year. We are also swim members at the pool. My family and I wish to thank Jim and his parks and rec staff, along with the extraordinary help from volunteers, Beth Wilson and Stephanie Minat, for making this a wonderful experience of our city's youth. 
The team interest grew to nearly 140 swimmers. We are enjoying the pool facilities all summer and hope this will continue for many more summers to come. Earlier in the year, a work session included a proposal of what the park could look like was introduced with a large array of ideas. These included several ideas regarding park use for equestrian trails and improvement expansions to the tennis and swim facilities. All were quite compelling in scope but we all know that a wish list based on a virtual unlimited revenue supply. Recent news finds the city dealing with a plumbing problem that manifested itself into something larger to which the city is addressing with great haste and that response is comforting. However, I fear this event may douse some of the enthusiasm from the council to investment to the property and keep and maintain what so many of my fellow citizens want to have, a public pool facility for all to use. And that's it. Okay. Thank you. All right. You would uh, vote for our presentation. Uh, hi, I'm Parag Agrawal, City's Community Development Director, and today we are he here in front of the City Council to give an update on the planning process of the former Milton Country Club. Uh, I also have with me Michelle McIntosh Ross, who is the project manager, and Teresa Stickles, and our consultant team from Kimmy Horn, Charlene, and Christina here with us. Uh, as you know, the planning work of the former Milton Country Club started approximately 12 months back. And now we are at the final stages of the planning process. Uh, we presented this project to the city council in uh, the February 11th work session. So the goal of today's presentation is to give you an update on the work that has happened in the last four or five months. So yes, Christina will give you a very broad overview of the entire planning process just to help the residents of Milton. But the goal of today's presentation is basically to get your feedback on the work that has happened in the last five or six months. So starting with a sort of a history. So the city acquired this property in January of 2018. This was the first property acquired through the green space bond money. Uh, in May of 2018, the, start, the city started the planning process. In October 2018, we had a number of community meetings in which we basically asked the community about their feedback. Uh, as I mentioned, in the February 11th work session, we got a very good feedback from the city council members in the work session which we had. And today, we just want to present you the updates based on the feedback which we received in the February work session. So this is a broad overview of the work that has happened in the last four or five months. Number one, the city conducted an online survey uh, to get the feedback of the neighborhood, more about the various active parts, how it can be used. The city received more than 1,000 responses for this community survey talking about how it should be programmed, how can the clubhouse can be programmed, and what type of services that should go in its place. In the February work session, the focus of this park was equestrian uses. But based on the feedback we received from the city council members, uh, horse trails is not the focus of phase one of this park. We have recognized that there are some other city properties which can be much more useful for equestrian uses. So you will see this big change here. <clears throat> we have also fine-tuned our cost estimates. So what we have heard from many stakeholders that the city acquired this property around 18 months back. They want to see this park open for the Milton residents. So we will give you some options to see how we can basically open the park and the cost estimates what it will take to open that park. Uh, the trail material options. So as we discussed when we presented to you the Providence Park trails, there was a lot of discussion about what materials should be there for the trails. So today also we are presenting you many options along with their 
cost estimates so that we can get the feedback from the city council members about the trail material options. Uh, talking about perimeter options, uh, in the last presentation, we talked about a four-board fence and how expensive it might be. But now we are providing some other options to the city council members, talking about, yes, four-board fence is one option, but what additional options can be there to buffer the property owners with the park? And then the last is we, ba we are basically refining our estimates for the clubhouse renovation. We will be presenting you three options with different dollar amounts, talking about what sort of renovations can be done to the clubhouse. So when Christina will uh, give you a presentation, these are some of the questions which we will be discussing at the end of the presentation, so, so just think over them. Uh, we want to open the park, but we want to open the park in the right way. Uh, so we just want to make sure we, have, we are covering all the steps, all the options which will be there, so just think over those. Second thing is clubhouse renovation. We will be providing you many options again, dollar amounts, what the priorities are of the city council trail materials and the perimeter options. So these are the four or five things which we would like to get your feedback in today's presentation. So with this, I will turn this presentation to Christina, who will give you a broad overview of the work that has happened, and then we can come back discussing these things. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. I am very excited to be here tonight to be able to present to you now after this past year of all of the work and input that we've received uh, to present the, the draft final concept for Plan the Park at the former Milton Country Club. We are really appreciative of all of the hard work from the staff, the partnership that we've received, the feedback that we've received from you as also the input that we've received from the community over the last year. And so we're really excited to be able to be here. Um, Prague introduced my colleague, Charlene Mingus. She's here with me today. And when you have the really hard questions, I'm going to turn around and ask her for all the answers. So you have seen the overview. I am not going to belabor this process, but for the good of the larger community, I'm just very briefly going to touch on some of the process elements. As we know, with any good planning process, it's got to be a mixture of quantitative and qualitative elements. So on the quantitative side, there was a lot of technical analysis that went into this. First, there was an environmental screening that happened across the entire 137 acres. Uh, the passive preserve itself had a site assessment, and then the active acres had the specific facilities assessment. So all of those have been completed and there are technical memos associated with those. To complement the technical work that had been done, there was a, a large amount of community input that went into the process, as Prague mentioned. We had a number of different uh, council, well, with council briefings, we had community meetings, um, committee meetings, public open houses where people had a chance to give input. We went to Crabapple Fest to be able to meet people where they are, and then also had two online surveys where people could give their feedback through the comfort of their own home. Through that process, the, particularly the public input process, the feedback that we received helped us to develop the guiding principles. You've seen those before. I won't read them to you. Um, but just know that these guiding principles were really the formation then of the process moving forward. It really helped to guide the direction of the development of the park. So where, have, where are we today on the park concept plan? All of the feedback uh, we, we did take into account, as Prague mentioned, the feedback that we received from council. What you will see here is a combination of, there's three major parts. There's the overall land management plan that constitutes the entire 137 acres. There is the active acres plan and all of the facility improvements associated there. And then the passive, uh, the passive park. So if you look and see the active acres, that 100, or that seven acres at the northwest corner, were obviously rotated. Those seven acres, there's a plan for those specifically. And then the passive preserve is broken out into two major sections. That 130 acres is broken out into the north woods and the south woods. 
Um, with on, within that, there is a trail plan that goes along with that. So you'll see three different components that we'll address in the presentation. Um, just very briefly, a couple of things that were removed since the last time you have seen this. Um, the equestrian trails were mo removed as one of the priorities. We do have some natural surface dirt trails that are in there as just something that can be for the short term, and if there is ever a desire to, to change the purpose of those, they can move forward in the future. We've also removed the connection, the direct connection to the Fulton County Schools site. Okay, so I'm gonna step through some of the, the detailed plans. The first is the former clubhouse and active acres. So you obviously are very familiar with what exists there today, so I'm not gonna go through that in detail. Now the first phase the concept A you actually have not seen. This is the base plan and it has been added since we last met with you. And this is really kind of the basis for if we really want to be able to open the clubhouse, what do we need to be doing in order to be able to accomplish that? And so what that includes are renovated men's and women's locker rooms, the multi-use space that I'm very excited to hear so many of the community members uh, speak in favor of. Uh, that multi-use space also has some community and art space next to it that can be implemented in the short range. Some pool and park storage. And then the informal kitchen and dining room, we're not including in the financial plan. We assume some sort of a vendor could come in and, and rehabilitate that specific space. Beyond the clubhouse, then interior, within the active acres, we also propose demolition of the deteriorating golf cart barn and shed, um, as well as making improvements to the sidewalk, curbs, and ADA ramps leading up to the clubhouse. So these components are really what we believe would need to happen just to be able to get the clubhouse open and up and operational. And that concept A is projected around $630,000. The next phase, so these build upon each other. Concept B for the initial expansion then builds upon that first concept A. And in this case, we have three multi-purpose community rooms that can be very functional. We can take down walls and uh, put them back up for different different types of events. We heard so much, uh, so much of a variety from the community of what they wanted to be able to do. So having that flexible space is really important. Having an open layout dining area that's flexible, some sort of potential catering kitchen. We did hear a in the survey that people don't necessarily anticipate a full service restaurant, but there, there was a lot of open different ideas about what types of food service could be there otherwise. We also couldn't open and tear down the walls with um, on the outskirts of the building because the floors are not able to uh, handle the outside elements, and so we've added an open air pavilion that could be used to complement some of the indoor spaces. Beyond the clubhouse, then we have active acres improvements, including additional tennis courts, a neighborhood playground, an event lawn, some sand volleyball courts, the addition of some bioswales, and then enhancements just to the, to the parking area, the existing 126 parking spaces that you have. So the concept B projected cost is around $1.4 million. So when you add that to concept A, the cumulative cost brings you to around $2 million. And then concept C is the final expansion. And we're just adding some additional elements to that. So we've got a double-sided fireplace at the open-air pavilion. It allows for a little bit more year-round usage. Um, and then also a patio adjacent to the open-air pavilion. On the active acres, we have some shade structures for tennis, the addition of a water slide, an improved event lawn, a small playground, and then some additional landscaping and berms. And so when you add concept C at around another $700,000, the full implementation of the active acres then brings you to around $2.7 million. So now let's talk a little bit about the trails phasing within the passive preserve in particular. So we also have, everything is phased because we know we want to be able to do some things more quickly than others. So in order to really get the park open, have people be able to safely access the site, um, there's some initial steps that need to be taken. So part of it is we know that some of the golf cart paths are in good condition, but some of them are not. So we want to be able to remove the deteriorating parts of the golf cart paths. Also, some of them are on current easements, and so we want to be able to take those away. Um, and in those cases, we would be building back natural surface trails. So it would be a little bit of a patchwork look at first, but from a safety perspective, we would feel comfortable with having um, those sections be there. We would be filling in, like I said, the new gaps. We might have some demonstration trail section and a dis addressing other site challenges just to make sure that everything is safe and operational. So that would be the first phase at just under $600,000 approximately, particularly for some of the, con the construction cost. 
The next piece that we see could be really important is making that loop connection, and so adding a side path along uh, the North Woods Loop along Dinsmore to be able to connect the two different sides of the U. That's really kind of the next phase. Moving forward from there then, we would want to go back eventually and recreate the, the U on the North Woods Trail. Um, just remove all the remaining golf cart paths and really build out a full natural surface trail. And so that obviously is going to require additional um, excavation and, and building of new trails. And then for phase two, so that's all happening in the North Woods. When we look then to phase two, that's really building out the trails on the South Woods side. So not only the full loop trail, but also some of the spur trails within that. So that's what we, we would look to for the phasing of the trails. Now let's talk a little bit about what the trail surfaces are. I've talked a little bit about them, but I want to get into a little bit more detail. So the trail surfaces, right now the golf carts are, the golf cart paths are built from concrete. We have heard that the community would not like to see concrete go back into the park. And so right in the short term, we're going to have some concrete as we tear up some of the deteriorating pieces. We will still have some of the good sections remaining until we can go in and pull out the remaining sections and build out just the full uh, natural surface trails. So for the natural surface trails, that would be either some sort of decomposed granite or crushed stone. We looked at a lot of different, um, more natural surface trails beside, that, are, that involve some sort of an aggregate and some sort of a stabilizer to go along with it. So what you can see here are some examples. They are, as you know, especially from the gravel roads, they're a little bit less expensive to build than things like asphalt and concrete, but they are more expensive to maintain. And so there is going to be that annual maintenance cost associated with, with keeping those up, to, up to, in shape. The other types of natural surface trails, so the, the main stabilized granite we would be using for the main loop trails. We also have natural surface trails that are composed of dirt, and those would be more for some of your spur trails. Um, once again, there's a maintenance cost associated with those. You might have to bring in some dirt and have a, bring in a bobcat to be able to, to level it. Um, but these are very, very true native surface trails. And then finally, in the areas where we've got wetlands and floodplains, we are going to have to introduce some boardwalk. In particular, the portion connecting the north woods and the south woods near Chicken Creek um, is going to require some boardwalk. It is more expensive. And there is a maintenance cost, obviously, associated with maintaining a wood surface. Um, but the boardwalks are beautiful, and they provide valuable connectivity in places where you might not otherwise be able to build a, a regular standard native surface trail. And then finally, when we start looking on the outskirts, particularly the section along Dinsmore, we've got an existing patchwork of concrete sidewalk that's there now. So we would look to replace that with some sort of a concrete or potentially asphalt if you wanted to consider that, but a, a, a more formalized, stabilized trail. So when we look at all of the different trail surfaces, you can kind of get an understanding of their relative costs relative to each other. As I mentioned, the boardwalk is, is one of the most expensive, concrete also being the other more expensive. Some of them come with pros and cons. Some are more expensive to build on the front end. Some are more expensive to maintain on the back end. But a lot of this also has to do with character and context and how you want to be able to have the development of the park and the trail system to really fit the character of Milton. So let's talk a little bit about the park perimeter <clears throat> options. We have a number of different options. Some of them are more fencing. Some of them are more landscaping. And so I want to talk through some of those different ideas. So first is the four board fence. It really is so fitting in Milton. And so this is obviously one of the options. Of, from the fencing option, it's actually the, the least expensive option as well of, of all the different ones we're looking at. It does create a very delineated, clear separation between the park and the home. But obviously, from a visual barrier standpoint, it doesn't create that same uh, visual barrier that you would get from a landscaping buffer. Um, we have, see that around $100,000 per mile. There are varying estimates, and we know some people have gotten this for cheaper. So we want to have somewhat of a conservative estimate, but not too conservative. Another fencing option, uh, the split rail fence could be another, another consideration. It's got the same types of pros and cons as the foreboard in terms of, you know, it creates a clear delineation, but it doesn't create a visual barrier. It is a little bit less expensive to maintain because you don't have to paint it. It's meant to kind of weather naturally, uh, but it is more expensive to, to build in the first place. 
So now moving into some of the landscape options, we've got three levels of intensity of the landscape barriers. So the first really is kind of our lower intensity. It's largely a mix of small shrubs and evergreen types, types of shrubs. It's obviously not creating that delineation that you get from a fence, but it creates more of a visual barrier, but it's on the lower end. So you're talking more shrubs and not so much trees in this. Um, it is the most permeable of the natural barriers in terms of things being able to come you know, to and from, but it is also the least expensive of the, the landscaping barriers. Stepping up from there, we have our, our medium intensity barrier. We start introducing some trees in addition to the shrubbery, so you get a little bit more elevation. Um, it's also a little bit more expensive. And then the highest intensity, we start actually introducing a berm in addition to the landscaping, and so you get a little bit more elevation, a little bit more of a physical separation, uh, but you also get a little bit more of a cost to go along with it. So when we look at all five of these together, you can see the fence options, the landscape options. There's about 3.6 <clears throat> miles of perimeter that we estimate uh, that would need, potentially need some sort of barrier separation. We expect that there would be some combination. In some places you might not need or want any sort of a barrier, in other places you might, and it's really going to be up to kind of decision, design decisions as well as uh, community and, and elected leadership decisions on what types of barriers get included in what parts of the perimeter. Christina, if I, make an, if yes. I may add, the cost of four-board fence, we forgot to update the number oh, We did. Here. I apologize. We updated it in the other two places, and we forgot. We lowered the. We didn't lower the cost. We got a revised estimate. Um, so thank you, Prague. Yes. We will update that in the official record. It's even cheaper. So we know that the environmental sustainability is a really important piece, um, particularly as we think about transitioning something that was once a golf course, very, very heavily maintained, very, uh, lots of less than desirable qualities probably from an environmental perspective. So how do we transition back to something that's more natural and more native? So I wanna talk a little bit about some of those things. So there are a couple more detailed design studies that are gonna be needed to really um, make sure that everything is, is up to uh, working well on the site. So a lot of the drainage pipes are, are deteriorating and it's really important that we have a safe space moving forward, um, and, a, and an environmentally sensitive um, and functioning, well-functioning space. So we recommend a hydrology study to really understand what is happening underground and to be able to then identify how we go about removing the underground drainage system and converting it back to its more natural conditions in terms of the, the water flow. Recognizing that's also going to change some of your the water flow on the site, in addition to what's already happening there, we recommend a Chicken Creek remediation study to really understand what's happening today, what could likely be happening with those changes in the water flow on site um, to really make sure that Chicken Creek is, is operating the way that it should be. We also want to make sure that we're bringing the green space back to what it once was. And some of that is actually happening now. The Southwoods, a lot of that has been is not being maintained anymore, and so some of the natural habitat is really starting to um, resurface, which is really exciting. So what, what we have on site in terms of the natural native conditions, Climax hardwood forest on the hillsides, pine forest in the flatlands, bottomland hardwood forest on the stream banks and the water-saturated areas, and then open meadows that have native flowers and plants. So how do we get to that place where we can get back to that? So. Thinking through the process on all of the sustainability front, we want to make sure that the hydrology and the Chicken Creek remediation studies happen sooner rather than later so we can really understand what's happening on site and what is projected to happen in the future. Then we actually have to go through and implement the findings from those studies, including things like removing the drainage pipes, restoring that natural water flow, but building in bioswales, that's a natural way to help to kind of retain the water and also to clean it before it goes back into the into the the water table into the system, and then remediate any of the creek as, as much as needed. Bring back that natural succession, like I said, is happening on the Southwoods side already. Um, we recommend bringing in an invasive species specialist that might take a, a few years to really, it takes about three years um, for to really rid yourselves of the invasive species that are on site. Um, and so that invasive species removal specialist would go through and plan and, and 
hopefully work with volunteers to be able to go and remove a lot of that what's out there over the course of those few years. And then introducing new native plants and trees back in where you don't already have enough of that happening naturally to kind of help reinforce what's ha what wants to happen naturally. And then there could be some other user amenities, things like uh, wildlife habitat stations like the Chimney Swift Towers that you see in the picture. So um, we know the city's already, already working with the Audubon Society to introduce some new opportunities to bring other bird types um, and native species back onto the site. So in terms of opening the park, we know that there is uh, such excitement from the community to be able to, to see, uh, to be able to access what, what the city now owns. And so we were talking and we were told about, you know, probably around a million dollars or so, what can we do with that million dollars to really get the park open? So what we've done is put together, it's a little over a million, uh, but kind of outline what we think are some of the most critical elements that need to be done. So really, first and foremost, in order to open the park and get people out there, we really want to make sure that that phase 1A of the trails portion is what's getting done first. So we need to make sure we're, we're ripping up the portions of the golf cart path that are no longer, um, that they're, are really deteriorating. Um, and we also want to pull the sections on easements and build in the new portions of natural surface trail to connect. So we want to make sure we've got a safe, accessible way for pe people to be able to get around. Uh, we've got a couple new bridges that we'll need to build with that new alignment once we pull the trail off of the, off of the easements. Um, and then addressing some of those other site challenges, other bridges that need remediation. So that's really, first and foremost, what we need to make sure happens. Beyond that, there's a couple of different ways that we could go, and, and some of it really depends on what the community wants and what the council and, and the mayor want. And so at a minimum for the clubhouse, what we think is we really need to demolish the interior, the clubhouse interior, demolish the roof and the facade, and then go ahead and put on a new roof. Get the building structure solidified, and then we can always go back later and implement the interior renovations afterward. Uh, make sure we're getting the utilities uh, fixed, and then also we know with the recent bathroom um, modifications that are needed, I'm not sure where the timing on that, but obviously we want to make sure that those bathrooms are up and operational for the swim team and tennis team and anyone who's visiting the site. So um, beyond that, depending on how far you want to take some of the perimeter options, it may not be necessary to start with the perimeter options at all or you may find that the parts of the community would like to see it sooner rather than later. So we've included some additional funding for the park perimeter, some average of those different park options, that um, the perimeter options that we laid out earlier. So that takes you to around 1.2 million. Now what you might find is maybe you want to invest more in the clubhouse and less in the perimeter options. So there's flexibility. I think at, at a minimum, really that first section, that trails, that 1A section is really what you want to make sure is that we've got the, the trails in a good stable condition and some of the bridges and things like that just to make sure it's safe for your residents to be walking around. And then the phasing of the clubhouse and the perimeter can kind of, um, it really up to you in terms of what you would like to move forward with. So that is my overall presentation. If you, I'm happy to entertain any questions that you might have. Yeah, Rick, go ahead. Um, just a question. When we talk about the loop connecting along mm -hmm. Dinsmore Road, I know there were some concerns about the, the hydrology, about the right-of-way, is that all resolvable? We could actually do a trail with not infringing on people's property? You, we would need to further study and look at the, the right-of-way, the site distance. I remember there was a conversation around site distance as well. So we think everything is doable to some degree. It just depends on what types of mitigating factors you might need to take into account. There might be some, I, I don't want to speak out of turn, I don't know what the right-of-way impacts might be, but I'm sure that they would be small compared to, if there were any right-of-way impacts, we're not talking about taking people's homes. We're talking right. about, you know, maybe a, a sliver of land that might be needed in the front of the property. But we would need to do further design to really understand what that looks like. But it's a relatively short segment, so we think it's definitely something worth pursuing. Okay, yeah, and I think that would make sense because otherwise you're going to have to backtrack. But the, the question I think we had was also a safety concern by how close it is to the road right. uh, and speeds that people go along Dinsmore. And you want to make sure you've got adequate buffer space right. in there and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. that would need to be designed fully. Okay, thank you. So, <clears throat> great presentation I enjoyed looking at and thinking about what we can do with the space um, for the 1.2 million dollars to open the park did mm -hmm. you guys 
um, guesstimate a timeline for that work that needs to be completed? We know the money would be theoretically set aside in the next year. We think you could do a substantial amount of work in that in that year's time frame. Now, some of the, depending on some of the different studies, you might need to do those at different times. Some of the plant, like, some of the things would be a little bit easier at certain times of the year. But I think in the next year, you could make significant headway in terms of being able to accomplish that in the next year. We did not lay out a specific timeline for how long that might take, but we think you could do substantial work in a year. Okay. And then the rest of it is, I mean, our risk in taking our time about doing all of the work that you guys have outlined is just the cost could potentially go up from where they are today. So if, if we put together a five or a seven year plan, the only thing we need to worry about is how we continue to update our estimates on what the work is going to be. Is that I think that's important. So one of the other things, and I didn't mention this before, but it was something we had talked about. So for instance, on the hydrology study, one, one method could be move directly to try to implement the, that very first phase one to try to get the trails implemented in terms of ripping out the, the deteriorating sections and building in the natural trail surface. But you're going to have patchwork, you know, in the meantime. Now, what you might want to think about doing is if you open it up and then you do the hydrology study, you may need to shut parts of the park down in order to be able to improve that. So another thought process would be, do you do the hydrology study earlier, find out what those impacts might be, because you might be better off waiting a little bit longer and doing it the full, full out the first time, including all of the hydrology impacts. It, until you do the study, we don't know what those impacts are going to be and what kind of an impact that may be in terms of closing down parts of the park. Um, but that might be something else to kind of think about is there could be another phasing element that if you do some of the underground work, we want to make sure that there's good, solid, stable. We want stink sinkholes in the middle of the park um, because you have a collapsed pipe. And so we don't think that that's necessarily, from what we can tell, an immediate concern. But there is going to be that consideration as you move on. And so it might make sense to consider that earlier. So, and that might direct your decision making in the short term. But otherwise, cost implications and inflation over time and construction materials, things like that, yeah. And, and also, um, we could, you know, possibly if, if we identify some things that might need to be started semi-immediately, uh, I'm sure we can, uh, you know, work within our existing budget to, you know, do something that makes sense to get started so that right. we don't, uh, doesn't cost us more later. So right. Anybody else questions, Laura? Was the hydrology study and the <clears throat> Chicken Creek remediation, was that on the opening uh, park view graph? Is that included? It's not included it's not. in the opening. Okay. Not in the phase one. It's a separate line item. Um, so I would agree that if we could look at that, you know, and get a handle on it before we start ripping things up and putting them in, because we might have to redo them as a result of what we determine in those studies. Right. I agree with that. Um, Obviously, the um, you know we you know we need to shore up the restroom thing. Um, my my concern with the tennis courts, I think that we have a uh, application in for the grant. But if we didn't get the grant, um, I'd like to see those courts resurfaced and budget put in for that. There we're really really getting to where they're dangerous. Um, and then also echoing those folks that are here from the swim team, just making sure that we capture all the safety and health issues that need to be, um, you know, prioritized ahead of, you know, this next step. We need to make sure that um, the clubhouse, I think, will, will be a great asset when they ha we have access to it, but the footprint of of that active acres, the parking is going to be very limiting. So I would just caution the council as we look at uses for the clubhouse beyond the first phase of just getting it to be a storage facility, that um, the birdhouse is a great example, that it's a great facility, but it, we're, we're pretty limited because of the parking. So uses going forward need to be um, uh, thought of and you know, when you're there and there's a swim meet going on and Alta matches are also going on, there's we are parking people in the neighborhoods around the club, and there's nowhere else to go. So on that point, if I might, um, yeah. one of the things that we did talk about, we did not do a parking occupancy study. We recommend that at whenever you have kind of that confluence of swim and tennis happening simultaneously, 
the, the, the city conduct some sort of a parking occupancy study to really understand what the impacts are because as you add uses and add people, there are going to be those impacts. It might be worth considering partnerships maybe with some of the schools nearby so that in off, like off school hour type sessions, you might have opportunities for offsite parking and shuttling. It might be something to, to consider to remove some of the parking impact to the neighborhood. Yeah, and that's that's why I, I was thinking where could we have off-site parking, and that's a tough area um, because there's not really a school close by. But just for consideration, I just wouldn't want to build uses into that clubhouse that we can't accommodate. Um, I agree with um, Council Member Morig on the um, Dinsmore that section, I think we're gonna see the side path. I think we'll see people walking on it, even if there's not a side path there. So I, I kind of put that as a priority as far as safety. Um, and I have a question about the, um, the playground that was shown. It says small playground area. Um, is and I don't have I don't know have the information and I thank all the people here from children's charities on the um, on uh, on the footprint that the children's charities um, playground needs is are we going to get information on that at some point if that is a possibility or let aren't you let if you don't mind let Parag address that the uh, options on that <clears throat> so yes uh, we do have enough space for the playground to go in if the city council chooses to prioritize that. We ha as part of the community planning process, we have heard some uh, concerns from the neighborhood about the traffic uh, that might generate. But as far as uh, council member, your question about uh, whether there's enough space for the playground, mm -hmm. yes, we have enough space in the playground that can accommodate the footprint of what they're proposing. Okay. Thank you, that's helpful. So then my next question would be, do we have enough space to park the, 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 the cars? And so I would just suggest some usage studies of, of um, what you anticipate, because I've heard so many great things about the park. You know, how many visitors? Is it seasonal? Do they require, you know, special handicap um, parking? If so, where does it need to be? Restrooms, et cetera. If that's the direction that we choose to go in. Um, with regard to the perimeter um, discussion, I, I would really like to see how the park is used first before we um, go into a very expensive area um, because I have four board fence protecting my farm and I watch kids hop it all the time to cut through to the neighborhood behind me, which, you know, I just want to make sure that what we do is effective and that it accomplishes what we set out to do because it's an expensive proposition. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. yeah, good presentation. Um, <clears throat> on the active portion that we have most of the use right now, uh, I think what Council Member Bentley had mentioned was important. I think we have a lot of, um, a lot of components there. Um, we talked definitely swim, definitely tennis, but the park is, or the, the playground is an element I think we need to get our hands around. I'd love to see a final design of what that footprint would look like of some kind. Um, so I think that would help us as a council determine if that is the right place for that playground. Um, so maybe it would behoove us to just, just finish that, include that, because it seemed like that part was kind of left out of this a little bit. I'd like to see that really have more of a focus in this and find out what that design actually would look like so we can make that decision and determination. Because we're going to, it's a lot of use right now. We just want to make sure we're doing that. So that's what I want to see. Thank you. Hey, Scott, quick question. Um, thank you for the presentation. That was great. Steve, so let's say we want to move forward. 1.2 million, let's just do it. What's the funding impact as far as the budget's concerned? Is this going to be a two-year funding Im impact? or It doesn't have to be. Um, it depends on, on how we prioritize um, other projects. Uh, but if the council determined that this was a priority to get done within X amount of time, the only limiting factor on this would, would be lining up the work, the people to do the work. Um, so my follow-up is we need to have a discussion on priorities within Parks and Rec. Is that correct? Or it, it actually yeah, it fits into the capital improvements. Sir. Yeah. And we're about to roll into that. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think that the, the next six weeks are going to help 
guide your decision on that as you see the different options as we're looking at different millage rates, things along those lines, help you decide if you decide that you want to, if you wanted to, to bring this out over three years, that could have a, lo uh, a different effect as if you said, you know, we want to see it done in six months. And I'm just talking about phase one. Obviously, the other phases are, would be multi-year projects. Yeah, we will have options that we can, in the next few weeks, as Steve said, that we can look at funding and whatnot. So, any, uh, any other questions? No, thank you very much for the presentation. This is is exciting, and uh, thank you also to the, uh, the citizens here and, and uh, uh, audience here for your input, too. So, Thanks. thank you. Right. So, thank you. So, I was told to keep it short, so, <laughs> uh, so we kept it short. Uh, so, we will we got some good feedback, we can incorporate that feedback into our final plan, and then we will go from there. Okay, thank and you. Uh, Heard Councilmember Bentley's comments and two on the, on the park. I'd like to, yes. you know, have you guys look at it, and see how that could all fit in, if that's an option. So, thank you. And I, I just thought of one thing: the the survey results that we did from the last time. Did, didn't we conduct a survey? Online survey. Yes, we did yeah. an online survey survey for the clubhouse okay. recently in May. Okay. Yeah, I, I'd just like to see those or oh, some sure some, different. you know, I just as we go into what we're going to try to make that into. I'd like to just see that. Thank you. Okay. All right. City, if you will please call the next item. Jeff. Jeff, just one last question. Right. Frog, could you also, when you're, you're pulling the stuff together for us, could you show us, we, we, I think there's one location we're looking at. Are there other, other locations for the, the park? Because we, we've had the group that came here talking about the playground. Mm -hmm. Parking, like Council, Councilperson Bentley said, is going to be critical, so that assessment, but then also if you could show us where you're looking at accommodating once we know the size, are there a couple of different options sure. within when you look at the plan versus just one place? Uh, how does that fit into the overall update of the building if we're going to go forward on that too? No, sure, that can be, yeah, okay. that could be easy. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. So if you please call the next item. The next item is overview of new broadband bill. Do we have any public comment? We do not, sir. Okay. It's Mr. Ken Gerard. And we're setting up the presentation now. Yeah, I need one. All right, uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, thank you very much. Um, it's uh, uh, great to be able to uh, present this to you this evening. Uh, this is a presentation with respect to Senate Bill 66 that I have actually provided before, um, and I'd, I'd actually provided it at the uh, Georgia Municipal Association City Attorney Luncheon, and I do know that it takes about two hours, so just go ahead and settle in. Uh, that's a joke. Um, I will try to... Uh, make it a little faster than that. Uh, it's actually sort of an interesting uh, presentation because it's, it's actually more, I will concede, uh, more of a staff presentation. This really gets into the, the nitty gritty of the bill. Uh, so I'm not gonna do that to you. This is more just of an overview. I just wanted to give the council a little bit of a taste of what is to come. So a little bit of background here. Last summer and uh, into the fall, um, representatives of, uh, the telecommunications industry, uh, mainly Verizon um, and AT&T, as well as representatives of uh, ACCG, the Association of County Commissioners of Georgia, and GMA, worked together uh, to try and put together a 5G broadband implementation bill uh, that would sort of be the I think, candidly, the, post, the poster board for what is one of the better 
pieces of legislation in the United States. Um, I will tell the, the council that the legislative wins were at the back of the industry. I hope you understand what I mean by that. Basically, the direction we got from the legislature was this bill is going to happen. So if ACCG and GMA want to have a place at the table to make it the best bill they can be, you need to get on board and, and assist. I was honored to be selected to assist in this, and so I did actually have uh, a good bit of input with respect to this bill. Um, I will tell you that GMA did a phenomenal job. I don't know if y'all know Rusi Patel at, at GMA, but he is a fine attorney and, and was instrumental in some of this language. So the, the big picture here is, uh, is that uh, as a result of those negotiations throughout the late summer and the fall of 2018, by the time the 2019 legislative session came around, we actually had legislation ready to present to the Senate and the House. And candidly, I think that for the most part, the bill that was worked out during that late summer and fall is the bill that was approved. And so um, let me give you, let me go ahead and finish. The finish is, is it's not effective yet. The bill becomes effective October 1st of this year. It becomes effective if you do nothing. In other words, it is self-effectuating. Come October 1st, the Senate Bill 66, technically called the Streamlining Wireless Facilities and Antennas Act, will become effective uh, and can be taken advantage of by both wireless providers and wireless infrastructure builders. Now, the city of Milton, to its credit, I'm actually going to get to a slide here in just a second, but I enjoy talking so much that I really don't need to. Um, the city of Milton has actually been a little bit of a, a renaissance entity when, when it comes to this sort of thing. You all have had before you, uh, Crown Castle has come before you and asked to do some limited rollout of some 5G infrastructure or I guess maybe wireless infrastructure. Uh, as has a company called Mobility, uh, has also come in front of you all and asked to do that, and you all have been fairly gracious. You all have held them to a pretty strict contract, uh, but, but have been fairly gracious in allowing them to do that. And candidly, that's sort of avant-garde. That's the way it's going. And the way to think of 5G and this rollout with respect to this small cell is to think of it as you're used to the monopoles, right? The big massive towers with the blinking lights on top of them, the balloon tests and all the, the pitchforks and the, and the red shirts because people don't like those because they're ugly. So this is not that. Uh, this is, and Mount Summer Longoria, you probably could teach this, but this is a different sort of technology. And my understanding, from a layperson, I'm the attorney, not the, the, the wireless technician, but my understanding is, is that these towers, these small cell antennas, are not towers at all, these small cell antennas um, are not as powerful, so, and so they need more of them, but they're not nearly as aesthetically unpleasant. Uh, in fact, right now, if you go down into Atlanta, you can see these, these small antennas strapped on a lot of things, parking decks and, and, and billboards, et cetera. So that's sort of the, the shape of things to come. So let me go ahead and begin a few just of the presentation. And forgive me if I bounce around, but again, I'm trying to give you an overview. This is, this is a different presentation that I would give if you were a planning and community development department where I'm trying to walk you through exactly what you can expect come October 1st. This is more of a high um, yeah, 10,000. We've got view. plenty of time. So. You do? Mm -hmm. Good. Well, listen, dinner is optional tonight, and uh, let me just go through. Here is the nuts and bolts of the Act. This is the reason for the Act uh, as set forth in the state law. Again, this state law has statewide application. A wireless provider, this is, this is the key, a wireless provider may co-locate small wireless facilities and install, modify, or replace associated poles or decorative poles under this chapter without an agreement with an authority, that's new, used to take an agreement, and without an implementing ordinance, used to require that too, not anymore. So what does a wireless provider mean? It means both a wireless infrastructure provider, and I, you can see in the, in the parenthetical down below, I said think Crown Castle, think of mobility, or it means a wireless service provider, think AT&T. So the statute captures both, and it allows them to co-locate. Okay, so every one of you ought to have in your mind what you think co-location means. Typically, whenever you think of co-location, you mean put something on something that already exists. That's pretty much what it means under this statute. What it means under this statute is, is if there is a piece of infrastructure in your right-of-way, let's say it's a light pole, um, they can co-locate, which means to put an antenna on that light pole so long as that light pole has the uh, engineering 
ability to withstand the loading of that infrastructure. But co-location also means under this statute that if that's really where they want to be, they have the right to take down that piece of infrastructure, that light pole, and rebuild it with something that looks a lot like what it looked like, but that has the engineering wherewithal, if you will, to, uh, to, to hold up the antenna. So that's a little bit of a nuance on the co-location, because you can actually take down something that existed and build it back uh, with a little more structural integrity to withhold and, and withstand the limits of the, of the, uh, the small cell antenna. Uh, and then, of course, they also have the right, meaning the providers, to install new poles. And, of course, that is the most unwanted thing because that means that you're being able to put something in the right-of-way that heretofore did not exist. And I don't have to tell you that, that local governments have a lot of things in your right-of-way. You've got cable and you've got uh, uh, water and sewer lines and all sorts of things, but this will allow you to be able them to be able to also install new poles in that right of way. And so, when a new pole comes in, uh, and individuals call and complain, you may be able to to say, "Well, this was a bill that that was adopted by the General Assembly that we really didn't have the ability to push back on, and simply had to go along with it." And of course, the objective is the objective is is to hopefully allow the implementation and rollout of new technology, preferably the, the 5G technology. And, and I know that the General Assembly, I think, was impressed that from an economic development standpoint, the state of Georgia needed to make sure that we allow the reasonable and efficient rollout of this new technology to keep us competitive with those other jurisdictions that are doing it. All right. I'm going to just skip around here. Again, this is a little helpful. Um, this is not a, uh, you know, a great depiction, but this is the idea of the small cell antennas. Um, I'm not going to get you into this wonkous de definition of what small cell is, but I do want to show you this next slide. That's a pretty good depiction. All right, so a couple of things there, and I, I kind of like to, to emphasize this. If you look on the right, do you see that's a that's a light pole? That is probably a what, what this statute would consider to be a co-location. What I suspect is, is there was a, a, a pole, a light pole there. That's where they wanted to put their uh, wireless facility, their, their, their small, um, small cell antenna. But that light pole couldn't maybe withstand the loading requirements, so they took it down and they built another one. And they built one that's more robust, and then they integrated the wireless antenna into the actual superstructure of the light itself. This other one, that is an antenna. You can see the antenna sort of in the middle, the middle picture. You can see the antenna jutting on the top, on the top of the pole. That's contemplated in this bill as well, sort of the antenna on top of the structure. But this is a sort of a good example of what these sorts of facilities can look like, and this is a, a good example of what you might begin to see in your right-of-way in the not-too-distant future. Um, let me see here. Some preliminary concepts. A city may make available to wireless providers rates, fees, and other terms. I don't have to tell you, but when this uh, negotiation began, the notion of what we get to charge these providers was a big deal. Uh, various municipal jurisdictions, the rates are all over the place, which is, of course was one of the arguments that the providers made why they wanted to standardize statewide legislation is because every jurisdiction was different. Every county was different. Every city was different. Some cities and counties wouldn't allow it at all. Some would. The rates were all over the place. And the providers were saying, look, for us to be able to implement and roll out 5G in any sort of a method that, that's efficient and that's cost effective and that allows maximum bang for the buck, we need continuity we need consistency, and we need sort of a level playing field among all the counties and all the cities. Uh, so do you want to charge fees and rates for us to be able to do this? Fine, but let's standardize it. And they are, and I'll show you what that is. Uh, we're no longer going to be able to enter into any sort of exclusive agreements with providers, no more exclusive agreements with mobilities, no more exclusive agreements with Crown Castles. Can we enter into an agreement with these providers? Yes. But remember, we're going to be negotiating against this statute. Do you understand? In other words, we may say we want to give you this contract, but they can always say, no, no, thank you. We'll take advantage of the statute, which we always know is our backstop. So our, how about this? Our leverage to be able to work out an independent contract with a, with a, a wireless provider is very limited because they can always resort back to the statute and, and sort of backdrop against this. Um, yeah, so if agreed upon, an authority, which is us, 
and a wireless provider may change the statutory rates and fees, but if we do, uh, we have to first of all make them public, which is not terribly novel. Of course, we have to make it public, and we have to provide them to uh, every other provider. In other words, anything we do within the realm of small cell, we have to make available to every provider. No exclusive this, no you got the best deal in Milton. doesn't work that way. Everything has to be equal to everybody, and the statute is always the backstop. The statute is always the backstop. Um, I, I, this is, the, the slide is called default, and the only thing I want to emphasize is, is if we do nothing by October 1st, the statute becomes effective anyway, whether we do nothing. Um, the statute does divide us up into different classes of jurisdictions, which is interesting. There's a class one, class two, and class three, and it's actually based upon the number of tax parcels that are in your jurisdiction. Population acts, which is the way that uh, the General Assembly back in the heyday used to divide up legislation among big jurisdictions down to small jurisdiction was by defining how many people you had based upon the last decennial census. Actually can't do that anymore under Georgia law, so the way this bill got around it was divide up jurisdictions by tax parcel. And so a class one authority is a county or city with 100,000 parcels or more. Think of Fulton, think of Clayton, think of DeKalb. Uh, and then you've got a class two, which is cities or counties with 10,000 to 100,000. And then you have a class three, which is um, 10,000 or less. This, this classification of jurisdictions in this way basically serves two purposes within the bill. Number one, if you are a class one jurisdiction, I don't think Milton will be a class one jurisdiction, they, the, the provider, before they begin to implement, before they begin to roll out, even before the bill becomes effective on October 1st, they have to come to that class one jurisdiction and sort of show the implementation plan. And the reason for that was very utilitarian. These jurisdictions, we've got to get ready because come October 1st, you know, when the, when the, 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 the clock ticks to midnight, a lot of these providers are wanting to roll out immediately. So literally, they're going to be on the, on the planning office door that morning at 8 in the morning with just dozens, if not hundreds, of applications for these sites. And so this was a compromise to say, all right, so in these big mega jurisdictions where y'all are wanting to really get your foot in the door and begin to roll out immediately, you've got to sit down with us. You have to, under the statute, sit down with us and sort of show us your plan so we can get ready so we can begin to maybe hire additional planners, hire additional application review people, because otherwise we're going to be caught flat-footed. So that's if you're a class one authority, they have to come to us and sort of show us their plan. Needless to say, from a, from a uh, competitiveness standpoint, that could be a little dicey because there's a lot of probably trade secret information in their rollout plan. It's exempt from the Open Records Act. Kind of interesting. Now, if you're a class two authority, which that may be where Milton is, is what I would suspect, we can ask for it. In other words, they don't have to affirmatively come and do it, but we can ask and say, we'd like you to come show us too, so we're ready as well, which is what I anticipate your ordinance is going to say when we adopt it, is that we do want to be put on this. You don't, doesn't have to, but we can ask for it. And if we ask for it, they have to do it. Okay. And then class three, they don't have to show in class three. Um, pre application meetings, I've discussed this. Fees and rates, I'll, just, I'll tell you what the fees and rates are very quickly. The fees, a fee is like a permit fee. So a fee is a non recurring fee for us to basically examine their application. So it's $100 per application for co location, which is the lowest fee. That's how much we get to charge if they want to strap their antenna on an existing pole. We can charge $100 for that review. Uh, if they want to uh, replace a pole. In other words, if they see a pole they like, but it doesn't have the structural integrity for them to put an antenna on it, they, we, they, we can charge them $250 for them to make an application to co-locate where what they really mean is, is we want to take that pole down and put another one in its place. And then if they want to put a new pole in your right-of-way where a pole has never existed before, it's $1,000. $100, 250 $1,000. Um, in addition, by the way, if they are hanging an antenna on City of Milton infrastructure, one of your poles, we can charge them an additional $40, basically rent annually, 40 whole dollars. <laughs> That's right. Okay. All right. So fees we've talked about, rates, 
The rates are basically rental rates. So fees, we've already talked about fees. Fees are the one-time fee for the permit. Rates are the recurring rates, basically to pay back to the people for being in the people's right-of-way, if you will. So once again, the rate is $100 per year for a co-location, $200 per year for a new pole, $40 if they're hanging their antenna on one of our poles in our right-of-way. As you can see, this is not going to be a huge revenue generator. Okay. All right. We could go forward. The rest of my PowerPoint presentation gets into what is required to be in the application. And from a staff perspective, and what I'll have to work with with your planning staff, is the fact that once an application is filed, it's, it starts various shot clocks. Uh, we basically have 20 days to review the application and let the applicant know of any deficiencies in the application. They then have a certain period of time to clean up those deficiencies. And then once the application is determined to be complete, we have a certain number of days to either approve or deny the application. It's all very regimented. It's all very fast. There are also opportunities for them to what's called batch applications, which basically means that they can take within a two mile radial circumference and they can send in like up to 20 or 30 different applications all under one batch. And which is what I anticipate is going to happen in the metro areas because again, their rollout is going to be based on discrete jur jurisdictional areas where they want to put an emphasis of, because remember, the small cells, it's not as powerful, more of them to service a particular area. And it's not really aimed at voice, it's aimed at data. Data is what's driving this. Um, and so, again, the, the batching is sort of you know, more of a, a, a technical, sophisticated thing, and I'll work with staff on that. I do anticipate, I mean, I've not received any direction, but I suspect Milton's gonna want an ordinance to take advantage of some of the areas in the state statute that do, um, I think we would be benefit, we would benefit by an ordinance. And so I will work with your city manager on that. The bottom line is, and this is the main reason I wanted to make this presentation to you, and I appreciate the city manager for letting me. I wanted just to put on the record that <clears throat> this is coming, that, that it's state law, it's not a function of Milton, and when some of these facilities begin to show up in your right of way, I wanted to at least have had this presentation where you can say, you know, the city attorney came and told us about this and we knew this was coming. We knew that we needed to make lemons, lemonade out of lemons, if we will. And so that's what we've done. And candidly, to suggest to you that in the mix, you know, a lot of people were very, very resistant to this bill um, and, and perhaps with good reason. But in the mix, this is, this is technology whose time has come. This is happening. The General Assembly and the state of Georgia clearly saw economic development benefit to, to assist in this. And so I, we just need to make the best that we can make of it and uh, do what we can to exploit the statute to uh, the benefit of the citizens of Milton. Councilmember Coons. Yeah, um, so this, pro <clears throat> this process has gone on now for some time, at least a year. And in, this, um, in all of this, does, have you by any chance or staff have an estimate about how many cells we might be expecting coming into the city? Is it 50? Is it 100, 200, 1,000? What's our estimate? And, or do we just have to wait until the, um, we officially have an ordinance and ask them to give us or plan to really know? Right. A couple of thoughts on that. Number one, I'm, I do work in a couple of jurisdictions. That, let, me, let me just say this. Everything that I am seeing suggests to me that the very dense metro jurisdictions are going to be where the first wave of this occurs. Mm -hmm. Um, which, and again, this is a compliment, that's not Milton. So in another jurisdiction that I work in, we have received some feedback from AT&T. Uh, they have seven sites. So my expectation is that with respect to a Milton, I suspect there is some demand. I suspect there is some areas in Milton where they need some better connectivity or throughput rates. I'm not sure what the terminology is, but I would wager it's going to be less collectively than 20 okay. is what I would suspect at first. Rick, um, it sounds like we don't really have any input on location. Is that correct? If they want to put a new pole, they're going to decide where it works and they have the right by this bill to actually put it. They'll apply, give us the application, but we can't say, no, we want you to move it half a mile down or... Two things on that. Thank you for that. That's a great question. And if I'd, in hour three, I get to that. <laughs> um, so, so a couple thoughts on that. Number one, 
Um, they have to, if they are not co-locating, but actually want to install a new, a new pole, they have to certify that they do not have any co-location options available. Okay. Uh, and, ha and, and that was a very negotiated point, is that if you're going to put a new piece of infrastructure in our right-of-way, you need to have a professional engineer certify that there is no other option available to do this. We don't have any lease that would avail make us uh, or, or enable us to do this, et cetera. And if it is in a residential district, we do have the ability to adjust the location. I think it's like 100 yards one way or the other. And okay. a, a follow-up on that, what about design? Because we saw a, a number of different designs just in those three pictures. One of them that had a light pole, it looked like it was a replacement, where it would be maybe standard height of what was already there, and then the pole itself extended up, looked like another 20, 30 feet. From a design standpoint, look and feel, do we have any input? We do, uh, we do, but it's interesting that you mentioned that as well. So the primary place that we have, if there is in fact a true bona fide historic district, and I'm thinking right now off the top of my head of like a savanna. So in a savanna, if they're gonna come in and make a, a build a replacement pole, it has to look like the sort of historic sort of poles that might be in a savanna. The kind main kind place- like those, those, uh cell tower poles from the 1700s, right? That's right, because, well, that's right, in the 1700s, when it was... When they were one, first one, getting started. One G. Yeah. Um, we also have, uh, we have some input with respect to height. So we have input with respect to height. Typically, the poles need to be consistent with the poles that are around them in the general proximity. Um, but as far as design, the key is, if it's a new pole, it's going to be what they want to build. But if it's going to be a co-location, meaning they have to take down a pole and build another one, it has to look reasonably substantial to what they took down. But if it's new, it doesn't have to look like where we've got some of the mass we the have, designs. Forgive me, Councilmember. We have the ability under our permit criteria to make reasonable okay. suggestions on that. There's also a volume limit to the antenna component itself. So, there is. So, so it's not like they could build something that looks, you know, hideous outside the bounds of about a one and a half foot diameter. Um, you read the sphere. bill. Yeah, yeah. That, that's correct. That is right. The, the compartment has, yeah. Is, 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 I didn't read the bill, but I did read this presentation that our city attorney provided us. It was really good. It was very eloquent. <laughs> very eloquent. It took me about an hour and a half to get through it. <laughs> Laura? Thank you. The, your presentation was awesome. I mean, the pictures for me do it. Right. <laughs> but very, very helpful. So if AT&T determines that they want to put up a new pole. Yes. And Verizon, uh, they are required to let Verizon co-locate there. If, yes. Okay. So we're, we're not going to get in the middle of that. And Okay. Um, so how do we know... Is what's the likelihood of these poles going dark, becoming not used? I, mean, I just want to understand if they're not being used. How do we know? I mean, they have to take them down. It, it's funny. The the statute speaks to that. It talks about the abandonment abandonment of the pole. Now, I will tell you that when we were negotiating this mm -hmm. was AT and T and Verizon. I mean, I, I remember saying we we won't. We won't know. I mean, I, I can't look at a poll and tell but you whether there's, it's actually doing what it's intended to do. But the, the statute contemplates that if a poll is not used, we can put them on notice. They have to remove it. And if they don't remove it, we get to remove it. So it does contemplate that. The key is going to be finding out if it's actually being used or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's reports that you can get from the service providers themselves that tell you how much traffic runs through a specific access point. So we'll be able to get that information. Right, and, and presumably, I mean, again, I wish I could tell you that the, the ongoing rates were high enough that they would not want to pay those rates if they weren't actually using the poll, but I think the rates have been set that, you know, it could be, it could be a while before they realize because there's just not going to be a significant amount. Now, you know, to be fair, maybe in, in, in Atlanta, if there are hundreds, if not thousands of those poles down there, the, the cumulative of the rates could be a lot, but I'm just not sure they would hit that critical mass up here of, of it involving that much money. Yeah. And, and this question is for uh, Steve. So do we have, some, so these are time frames that we have to make, uh, you know, good on. So do we have a staff person that will um, 
currently? I'm, I'm guessing not, and so we need to include that in our planning. If the volume is what Ken is predicting, um, I think we'll be all right. If it, uh, if when we, when, once the ordinance is passed, and I assume that you'll pass an ordinance where we're going to be asking for that information, if we find that it's going to greatly increase, we could, it, we can quickly expand our resources with one of our contracted partners if we need to. But again, based on what Ken's telling me, I'm not too concerned. Okay. I, th I think the city manager's right on that. I mean, I, I do think there are gonna be some jurisdictions that are really gonna struggle with this at first, but I don't think Milton and Kennedy, many of the jurisdictions I work in are gonna be those. Okay, Joe. So, so 5G is all about data, and it's all about data mobility which means that the logical place for most of these access points is going to be places where traffic is moving. Not only walkability, so people walk around with their cell phones, but more importantly, people in their cars. And so that's why I think this is all about getting to the right poles on the right streets and at the right intersections. Um, the, the question that I have is there's only so many service providers that are going to be able to locate on a single pole. And the bill, I don't think, provides for us denying um, a service provider from providing or putting up their own pole. Does, is there anything in there about um, limits related to how close in proximity two poles can be or anything like that? Because otherwise... What will happen is you'll get these hot spots where people need access and multiple poles will have to be in the same place to support all the service providers. That's, yeah, that's, that's actually correct. And I don't think there is a setback requirement from pole to pole. I think that goes back into what sort of the underpinning of your question is, is if they have an area, they have to meet the demand we have to, and it's in the right of way, we have to make that area available. Um, the good news is, of course, is, is that it's not just right of way where these can go. These can go on support structures, which can include water towers, which can include billboards, which can include the side of buildings. And th that can be negotiated privately without us. And if it's done in our right of way, this, remember this, council members, this bill only pertains to the installation of this in our right of way. These antennas are innocuous enough from a size standpoint that they can still go other places and not be in the right of way. That's the final fallback, but I don't think there's a setback. Okay. Anybody else? No, that is helpful. Thank you, Ken, for presenting that. So. All right. Anything else? If not, we'll adjourn the work session. Thanks. Sorry about your eye. Thanks. <laughs> it'll be, it'll know, get better sometime. Thank you. Someone once said that in every circumstance,